Good evening and welcome to PWTF's virtual festival, The Untold Voices in Voting. I'm Molly O'Connor and I serve on the PWTF Board of Directors. This is our sixth annual festival and we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. In doing so, we are amplifying voices that are previously untold, particularly women activists whose stories were left out of the narrative of the suffrage movement. Even though we are not in a live theater space where the show belongs, we are experiencing tonight's performance of I Woke Up This Morning With My Mind by Teresa Miller together. We ask that if you enjoy this experience tonight, please give a donation. The link will be posted in the chat. We pride ourselves on compensating all of our artists. And we'd like to thank our many donors who have made this show possible. We also want to extend our deepest thanks to the Philadelphia Cultural Fund. Our 2020 Art and Culture Grant has allowed us to further our creative work for the good of our community and for all Philadelphians. Please note that your video and audio will remain off for the duration of tonight's show, but will be turned on for an applause at the curtain call. At the end of the reading, we invite you to stay with us for a talk back with our artists. During this time, we will host a Q&A and we encourage you to share your questions or comments by raising your hand or typing them in the chat box for our artists to respond. Should you think of your question during the show, you may add it to the Q&A feature at any time. Don't worry, this won't interrupt the show. We are excited to present, I woke up this morning with my mind as a one woman radio play that has been pre-recorded for the Zoom platform. Join us again on Sunday and throughout the rest of the 2020 festival for a series of stage readings to be performed live on Zoom. Tonight's performance is written and performed by Teresa Miller with assistance from Joshua A. Campbell and stage managed by Zach Apony. For the full festival guide, please see the chat. This play was produced in partnership with Jowska Playworks, an assembly of playwrights of color who are committed to creating works for the stage that shift the perceptions and inaccuracies about the African diaspora by bringing to the foreground stories and experiences that have too long been untold. This partnership celebrates black suffragists and explores the dominant and lost feminist narratives of the movement. We thank you all for joining us tonight to amplify untold voices and we hope you enjoy the show. I Woke Up This Morning With My Mind, a radio play by Teresa Milk. Setting, Mississippi, August, 1963, Monday. Sounds of footsteps and iron doors slamming, wailing and crying. Fanny Lou is shoved inside of a jail cell she falls at the feet of a young woman who was put in the cell not too long before her. The young woman helps her up, but doesn't speak. Fannie Lou speaks. She didn't say a word. When she helped me off the floor, I thanked her. She still didn't speak. I said, what's your name? Still nothing. She looked more terrified than I was. Were you beaten? After a while, she finally answered me with a nod. 
She only nodded her head. What did they do to you? She still didn't say a word. I didn't know what they were gonna do to me. I was worried about myself and the others. Every few minutes I'd hear the guards talking, but that was it. The only thing I did was get off the bus. I wanted to see why it was taking so long for the others to get back on. I was excited about a trip, but I was more excited to be going back home to my family. I looked at the young woman in the cell with me and she didn't even bat an eye. No movement, just still. I got a good look at her. All of the light was gone from my eyes. Excuse me. She still didn't speak. Excuse me. The young lady looked in my direction, but not a sound came out. I sat down and started to hum a spiritual. It looked like she started to come around until the guard yelled out for me to shut the hell up. Are you here alone? I asked her. She turned and looked at me and softly said, yes. Why did they throw you in here? She said, I don't know. Finally, she asked me a question. Why are you here? I don't know why I'm here either. I got off the bus to see what was going on and the next thing I knew I was being hauled in here just like you. I still don't know if they're okay or not or I don't even know where they took them. She said, who's they? I said the highway patrolman, the one who brought me in here. I started rubbing my side and my leg. You okay? She said. I'll be all right. He only kicked my body, but not my spirit. When you're sitting somewhere with only your thoughts to keep you calm, it puts another layer of perspective on your life. I felt like I was waiting for my turn to come. My turn to die today. I started to wonder if I was gonna turn out like this woman. Whatever happened to her must have been God awful. The only thing I could think of was to introduce myself the way I see it. If one of us made it out of here alive, I could tell people about her or she could tell people about me. My name is Fannie Lou Hamer. Nice to meet you, Fannie Lou, she said. She still didn't tell me her name. She said, that was pretty. What was pretty? That tune you were humming, it reminded me of when I was a little girl in church on Sundays with my mama. You sound like you can sing. I told her thank you. How long you been singing? I told her I had been singing my whole life, but there's plenty of people out there who sound better than I do. She said, I can tell. Well, I felt offended. Did you mean you could tell other people probably sounded better than I do? She said, no, 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 ma'am. I mean, I can tell you've been singing your whole life. Oh. She said, when I was listening, you sounded like you were pulling that tune from another world. Practice, that's all it is. 
Sounds like you practice visiting that world quite often. I told her, I visited that world every day, so I have to sing. It reminds me to keep fighting. I could tell she didn't know what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> ah! There was a woman in the cell next to me. The jailer went to her, took her out and walked her past our cell. The next thing I heard was her screaming. Don't you touch her! That was June Johnson. She was only 15, if not a day. The young lady told me to be quiet. I couldn't keep my mouth shut, sitting there knowing those guards are doing God knows what to that girl. But it was nothing I could do. One of those guards came to our cell and asked me who I was. I told him I was Fannie Lou Hamer and that the purse you men took from me would prove that I was. He walked away. You shouldn't have said that, ma'am. I told her he wanted to know who I was. So I told him the woman had this scared look in her eyes and shook her head. Did I say something wrong? That's what I asked her. She sat there quiet like she was when they first threw me in here. Before I knew it, another guard came and opened the door to our cell. He snatched me out and, and threw me in another cell by myself. I thought I was going home, that it was all a misunderstanding. But the next few hours, Things were done to me I, I wouldn't wish on a stranger, you know. They dragged me out and put me back in the cell with the woman. I couldn't do nothing but fall asleep, but I thought I was gonna die if I did go to sleep. I fell asleep anyway. Tuesday. I think I slept through the night and most of the next day. When I woke up, I realized that I hadn't died. The sound of my heart beating in my chest was my alarm clock. I looked over and saw the woman staring out to nothing. I couldn't feel my face. I tried to move my arm, but the blood had dried from the beating. It felt like a sticky tape was on my face and in my hair. I looked up and saw the young lady over at the sink. There was a sink and two washcloths in our cell. She came over to me and wiped the sticky blood from my hair and face. You shouldn't have talked to that guard like that, ma'am. She was right. During the night, she told me she kept a cool cloth on my face. They had beaten me so bad, I, I had a fever that took all night to go away. My whole body was numb, but I was angrier than any pain I could feel. I couldn't move. She came over and helped me off the floor where they left me. She kept staring at me. I soon realized I was starting to look like her when I first saw her, but it was morning and I still had my mind. I now know what they did to her. Might as well be dead. All of a sudden, teach me that song. came rambling
coming out her mouth. The only thing I could do was mumble to her, what song? The one you were humming yesterday, your fight song. I fell off to sleep. She started to shake me. I couldn't help it. All I wanted to do was close my eyes. She said, I didn't recognize you when you first came in, but the, the more I studied your face and started putting things together, I knew who you were. I heard it, but I was too exhausted. You're that Negro lady who's going all over Mississippi trying to get people to vote, getting people to, to, to register to vote. I nodded my head. You can get into a lot of trouble for doing that, ma'am. I told her it looks like I already did. I laughed a bit. She didn't find it funny and I didn't either. I found it strange. I've been fighting my whole life and it's made me sick and tired. But now I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. Having a life nearly beaten out of you while put a whole lot of things into perspective. I don't think I want to do that, ma'am. Seems like anybody who tries to do it ends up hung or in your shoes, she said. She asked me, what did those men do to you? I didn't tell her. What does voting get you anyway? She said. I told her, when you have the right to vote, you're no longer a second-class citizen, that you're no longer less than a human being. I don't look at myself like that anyway, ma'am. I said, but other people do. The same people who put us both in here are the same ones who kill us to keep us from having the same things they have. You are a first-class citizen with all the entitlements of anyone who has a job or owns a home. I didn't know whether I offended her or shocked her. Made me think about this family I knew when I was growing up. They lived up the road for me in Ruleville. Nothing but a bunch of girls. The mother, the father. It was seven girls. The father owned the land that his home was on, but he didn't own the home. The father wanted to vote, so he went down to the county seat and put his name on the registration board so he could register to vote. His landlord found out and threatened him to take his name off the boy. The young lady asked me, what happened? He refused to take his name off and the landlord made him and his family move, made a move that night. He moved to Drew, Mississippi, and they heard about him there, so that landlord made a move. Then he moved on to Cleveland, Mississippi, but his wife got sick and had to be taken to a hospital in Jackson. But no hospital wanted to take her on account of he wanted to vote. She asked me, what happened to her? I told her she died. She was shocked. Something came over me though, something that made me stronger than my situation. I can teach you how to vote. She looked at me. I'll teach you the song if you let me teach you how to vote. 
She agreed. Wednesday. I still felt like hell hit me twice. I looked at the young lady. Tell me about yourself. I was born in the Mississippi Delta. I lived there until I was about 14 years old. I'm the youngest of seven children. My father was a butcher, but he was also a sharecropper too. When times were good, we move off the plantation. My mother met my father during revival at my great grandfather's church. My father had one of those cars that you had to crank up to start. And within a few days, my father convinced my mother to elope with him. Even though my whole body was beaten, I was still able to think about her story and smile. I saw a light in her for the first time. I explained to her about the registration and how she had to do it and what she needed to study in order to register to vote. I looked around and realized it's been two days and I haven't heard from anyone. I didn't know if I was getting out of jail alive or dead. But even in jail, I was able to help somebody vote. The noise from the guard startled both of us. I thought they were gonna take me back in that room again. I was free to go and I have Mr. Andrew Young to think for getting me out, for getting us all out. All of a sudden I heard somebody singing and it wasn't me. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Then I sang. All in the jailhouse, I'm gonna let it shine. All in the jailhouse, I'm gonna let it shine. All in the jailhouse, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I could barely hold the tune. She called out to me. Thank you, Miss Fannie Lou Hamer. My name is Yvesta Simpson. End of prologue. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh yeah, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.
Fannie Lou Hamer holds up two pieces of paper, her registration form and her test to turn in so that she can register to vote. These are for the man at the counter. I was born in 1917, October 6th to be exact. It was 20 of us in the house. If you include my mother and father, that makes it 22. <laughs> That's a lot of us, I know. They had a lot of love to give, a little bit too much to each other, I guess. We had a farm, all of us took part in taking care of it. My daddy had a lot of pigs and cows. Considering it was so many of us in the family, we were doing okay for ourselves. One day, daddy noticed one by one, the pigs and cows were moving slower than they normally would. Suddenly they started dropping dead right where they stood. Dropping dead in the dirt. We found out later a white man from another county was coming by late at night when we were sleeping and giving them poison. Daddy had to burn them all. I've never seen someone that hurt before in my life until. Well, after that we had to go. We moved from Montgomery County to Sunflower County, Mississippi, where we worked as sharecroppers. Fannie Lou Hamer looks up at the paperwork again. I walked right on up to that counter. I had a right to be there just like anybody else. The form was a little tricky though. It's 21 questions. Most of them are pretty straightforward, like my name and occupation, date of birth, and where I live, and was I married, and what district I lived in, and whatnot. My occupation was a sharecropper and a bookkeeper, a good one too. See, I've been working since I was six years old. I picked cotton, lots of it. By the time I was 13, I could pick two to 300 pounds of it a day. Backbreaking work for a child. It's backbreaking work for anybody, actually. In order to pick as much as I did, you have to learn to move really fast while in a half-seated position, you know? And if you have small fingers like I do, you can pick the cotton out the bulbs most of the time without getting cut by the sharp thorns. My mama taught me that. The man at the counter asked me, what were the de facto laws for voting in Mississippi? De facto laws? I told him I knew as much about a de facto law as a horse knows about Christmas Day. The application was rejected. The news traveled so fast about me registering to vote, I was told to leave the plantation. I didn't care. The way I see it, at least I didn't escape. If I was living back then when people were escaping, I knew I would have never had a chance at living. I told that man at the office that I'd be back again and I would pass that test. As long as I had breath in my body and God woke me up the next day, nothing and no one was gonna stop me. I went back again and I failed it again. They didn't shut the door on me this time. But they did tell me to go back where I came from. I'm from here. I built here. I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I should have given up, went home, continued picking cotton and making numbers to add up the right way, but I didn't. I was even shot at 16 times by the Ku Klux Klan. And I didn't catch a bullet one time. Not one damn time. The joke was on them, I wasn't scared. 
I don't get this scared business. They can only kill me. And they've been doing it little by little the whole time I've been alive. So what's there to be scared about? I knew the third time was the charm. At least that's what most people say. On January 10th, 1963, I took the test again. And guess what? I passed. But I lived in a Confederate state. So Mississippi required me to have a poll tax. I found out later that poll tax is a fancy way of saying a head count. I basically had a tax on my head that I had to pay for myself in order for my vote to count. I paid it. Somewhere outside of Indianola, Mississippi, 20 minutes from Louisville or 20 minutes from home. Sounds of people talking on a somewhat crowded trailways bus back to Mississippi. When we get back home, make sure you contact everybody we met today. I want to make sure they understood what we showed them and told them to do in the event they ran into some problems. I'll be sure to do just that. All of a sudden, everything came to a complete stop. I didn't know what happened. I needed to go find out. After Fannie Lou was released from jail, she decided to tell her account of what happened the night she was on her way home from a voter registration workshop to anyone who'd listen. One person she told her story to was Malcolm X, and the other was to the Democratic National Convention, which was televised later the same day. Lots of chatter and commotion from inside the Credentials Committee gathering. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee, my name is Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, and I live at 626 East Lafayette Street, Rollville, Mississippi, Sunflower County, the home of Senator James O. Eastland and Senator Stennis. It was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register to become first class citizens. We was met in Indianola by policemen, highway patrolmen, and they only allowed two of us in to take the literacy test at the time. After we had taken this test and started back to Ruleville, we was held up by the city police and the state highway patrolman and carried back to Indianola where the bus driver was charged that day with driving a bus the wrong color. After we paid the fine among us, we continued on to Ruleville and Reverend Jeff Sonny carried me four miles in the rural area where I had worked as a timekeeper and sharecropper for 18 years. I was met there by my children who told me the plantation owner was angry because I had gone down and tried to register. After they told me, my husband came and said the plantation owner was raising cane because I had tried to register. And before he quit talking, the plantation owner came and said, Fanny Lou, do you know? Did Pep tell you what I said? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I mean that. He said, if you don't go down and withdraw your registration, you will have to leave. 
Then he said, then if you go down and withdraw, you still might have to go because we're not ready for that in Mississippi. And I addressed him and told him and said, I didn't try to register for you. I tried to register for myself. I had to leave the same night. On the 10th of September, 1962, 16 bullets was fired into the home of Mr. and Mrs. Robert Tucker for me. That same night, two girls were shot in Ruleville, Mississippi. Also, Mr. Joe McDonald's house was shot in two. In June the 9th, 1963, I had attended a voter registration workshop and was returning back to Mississippi. 10 of us was traveling by the Continental Trailway bus. When we got to Winona, Mississippi, which is in Montgomery County, four of the people got off to use the washroom and two of the people to use the restaurant. Two other people wanted to use the washroom. The four people that had gone in to use the restaurant was ordered out. During this time, I was on the bus. But when I looked through the window and saw they had rushed out, I got off the bus to see what had happened. And one of the ladies said, it was a state highway patrolman and the chief of police ordered us out. I got back on the bus and one of the persons had used the washroom got on the bus too. As soon as I was seated on the bus, I saw when they began to get the five people in the highway patrolman's car. I stepped off the bus to see what was happening and somebody screamed from the car that the five workers was in and said, get that one there. And when I went to get in the car, when the man told me I was under arrest, he kicked me. I was carried to the county jail and put in the booking room. They left some of the people in the booking room and began to place us in cells. I was placed in a cell with a young woman called Miss Ivesta Simpson. After I was placed in the cell, I began to hear sounds of licks and screams. I could hear the sounds of licks and horrible screams. And I could hear somebody say, can you say, yes, sir, nigga? Can you say yes, sir? And they would say other horrible names. She would say yes. I can say yes, sir. So well say it. She said, I don't know you well enough. They beat her. I don't know how long and after a while she began to pray and ask God to have mercy on those people. And it wasn't too long before three white men came to my cell. One of these men was a state highway patrolman and he asked me where I was from and I told him Roeville. He said, where are you gonna go? I said, I was going home. He said, we're gonna check this. And they left my cell. And it wasn't too long before they came back. He said, you are from Ruleville, all right? And he used the curse word. And he said, we're gonna make you wish you was dead. I was carried out of that cell into another cell where they had two Negro prisoners. The state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro to take the blackjack. The first Negro prisoner ordered me by orders from the state highway patrolman for me to lay down 
on a bunk bed on my face. And I laid on my face. The first Negro began to beat me. And I was beat by the first Negro until he was exhausted. I was holding my hands behind me at that time on my left side because I suffered from polio when I was six years old. After the first Negro had beat until he was exhausted, the state highway patrolman ordered the second Negro to take the blackjack. The second Negro began to beat and I began to work my feet and the state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro who beat me to sit on my feet to keep me from working my feet. Oh. Oh. And one white man got up and began to beat me in my head and tell me to hush. One white man took my dress and worked it up high. He walked over and pulled my dress. I pulled my dress down and he pulled my dress back up. I was in jail when Medgar Evers was murdered. All of this is on account of we want to register to become first class citizens. And if the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives are threatened daily? Because we want to live as decent human beings in America. Thank you. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sometimes it seems like to tell the truth today is to run the risk of being killed. But if I fall, I'll fall five feet, four inches forward in the fight for freedom. I'm not backing off. I'm singing and praising with my mind. Stayed on freedom. I'm singing and praising with my mind. Stayed on freedom. I'm singing and praising with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have to build our own power. We have to win every single political office we can where we have a majority of black people. I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stayed on freedom. I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stayed on freedom. I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 
Never forget where you came from and always praise the bridges that carried us over. It ain't no harm in keeping my mind stayed on freedom. It ain't no harm in keeping my mind stayed on freedom. It ain't no harm in keeping my mind stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. When I liberate myself, I liberate others. If you don't speak out, ain't nobody gonna speak out for you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I founded the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and all of this happened because I wanted to register to vote. I wanted to become a first class citizen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I woke up this morning with my mind. I would applaud if I had two hands readily available, but a snap will have to suffice. Thank you so much for that beautiful moving piece. Um, I know that in the darkness here where I am listening to the crickets, I'm so thankful for everyone's freedom. Well, some of our freedoms um, and uh, can only hope that we move ever forward. Um, so I'd like to start <laughs> reading the comments. Yes, all the clapping in our homes. Um, I'd like to start our Q&A. Um, I know that was a lot to take in, but um, I would happily pose our first question. Um, so my first question is, was there, because all of that, I mean, the whole time I was listening, I was wondering, I was looking for that point of something particularly poignant, but every, every moment of that oh, was wow. so moving. I was just, especially with the radio play, yeah. you, you know, you have to really listen. And I was, yeah, so you, you have to use your other senses, your hearing more so than your eyesight. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. in a way it's more intimate. Mm hmm I think it's more intimate. It's like a bedtime story almost, mm -hmm. that kind of intimacy. Um, but I'm wondering if there was anything in 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 before writing the script or before you started rehearsals, if there was any moment that just really was a moment of recognition or? I think it was. Uh... So many times you hear about um, civil rights activists, you hear about the activists and what they uh, are doing and the accomplishments and the things that they're doing there. But you don't hear about their, you don't hear so much about what, where they came from. It, it, where they came from isn't so public. And Fannie Lou, Lou Hamer's life was. And on top of that, she was just one of those people that you would probably walk by on the street. She wasn't, she wasn't, she was a sharecropper. She was a woman who struggled her entire life before she got into politics. 
And when she got into politics, she struggled even harder, but she kept going. And it reminds me of so many people I know, so many people in my family, even my mother, you know, but yeah, she just reminds me of the person that we would least expect to be the person Fannie Lou Hamer is. But I guess all it takes is that one thing that just, you know what, I can't do this like this anymore. I got to do something. And I, that's, that's, that's how she was. That, that was her. I'm not standing for this. I mean, because we all have our end of the last rope, that one last thing that her one last thing was, you're not going to keep me from voting. You're not going to, no matter what you do, you're not going to keep me. You're not, I'm not going to be ignored. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we have some comments and uh, questions from our viewers. Um, I'll keep these anonymous just, <laughs> just in case. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, we have, oh, Kristen. Sorry, I lost my uh, mute button. Um, but oh. uh, so just quickly, if I could jump in. Um, uh, Emily is going to switch us all over to become panelists so that we okay. can open up the floor. Um, so just as a heads up for everybody watching, it's going to seem like uh, it, the Zoom sort of went out or cut out for a second. It's going to load, but you'll pop right back in and you'll be panelists. You know, I encourage you to, um, you know, stay on mute if you're not speaking, but if you are, um, you know, if you have a question, you know, feel free to get your video in. So we want it to feel like a you know, a community talk back. So Emily's going to bump us all up to panelists. So okay. stand by as, as the Zoom loads for a minute and we'll all be back in. And when we get in, we can do a big round of applause as well. <laughs> Exciting. Feels like the family's all back together. <laughs> I'd just like to say that I'm tearing up right now at oh. the amount of faces that are here. Yeah. Um, the mothers that are here, Polly. <laughs> Polly. That it's just yes. so wonderful that even amidst <laughs> this, we can all share this together. So thankful to see all of these faces, all of these names. Thank you. I had had my hand raised before on the uh, Zoom feature, but it went away. So oh, okay. at some point I'd like to ask a question. I, uh, yeah, we'll definitely put you up before. So I feel like, you know, as, as we're getting on, let's just do our round of applause, applause really quick and then we'll jump right back into the. <laughs> Yay. Yay. All right, take it away, Marissa. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so thank you, David. We just have a question right before you um, that we would like to start with and then happily go to your question. Um, so we have a, a comment that this was just wonderful. Um, this person has been a fan of Ms. Miller's plays for a number of years and oh. they are wondering um, if you could 
talk a little bit about how you go about getting into the mind of your characters? Um, lots and lots and lots of research. Uh, fortunately, I love to read and I love history. So that helps a whole lot. And sometimes you can get lost in the weeds when you're researching some, uh, someone and you have to be able to um, think about what you're going to write about and stay focused with that because that's one of the things that I uh, do when I'm when I want to write a play. When I when I'm I, I try to find the thing about the person that's least written about. And and in Fannie Lou Hamer's case, what was interesting to me is that she was put in a jail cell for about three days with this woman. And a lot of people know about what happened afterward, but I was I wanted to write a story around what if there really there what what kind of conversation went on between Fannie Lou Hamer and this woman because they were sharing a cell together for three days. And then um, I think the story took off from there. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so David, would you like to ask your question? Thank you. Teresa, that was uh, really well done. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, it, it, it had a lot of uh, emotion and must have been challenging for you to perform. Yes. My question is, the parallels to contemporary times are obvious. Um, how do you think your protagonist made the decision to go cross the Rubicon, if, if I can use that uh, uh, expression, to stand up and risk everything to stand out and, 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 and make a statement? And, and how do you think that should guide us in terms of how we behave in these times? Um, I think Fan Lou Hamer, she was remarkable to me because she wasn't the only thing that she had in common with everything that she did was that she wasn't scared of anything and she had no fear. And um, uh, just paralleling it with our own personal lives, when it's something that you really, really need and it's something that you really, really want, you'll do whatever you have to do to get it. And if it's peace, You'll do whatever you have to get. You'll do whatever you have to do to get the to to obtain peace and to keep peace. And and in her case, she wanted she did she wanted to be a first class citizen. She already was, but she had to prove it, and she did. And uh, as far as today goes, I mean that's a that's a question for. I ask myself that. I mean, if everyone practiced being compassionate and hopeful and didn't hate, um, I think we would accomplish a whole lot more. And, and, and she was like that too. She didn't hate anybody. So I think what we can do is take from her is to not be, not be scared to speak up, not to not be scared to defend anyone. Don't be scared to call out something and call it what it is, whatever it is. But do it in a way where you won't uh, hurt people. You don't want to hurt anyone in the process either. That's not, I don't, she wasn't, she, even though she went through all of that, she still was graceful and compassionate. And that's what I think everyone should take from it. Great, wonderful question, David, thank you. Kristen, I saw your finger. Hi, um, so um, Teresa, echoing what everybody said, that was something else, truly moving and, 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 the, uh, and, and it was so, 
specific, which I loved as well. Like I could, I felt like I was there the way that you created the dialogue and everything was awesome. Um, my question is, I know that this piece existed in a previous form that it was yes. performed in front of a live audience on a stage. Um, so what, can you talk a little bit about what that process was like adapting it or, you know, maybe like what was the hardest part or did you have to like lose anything or did you gain anything new this time around? Yeah, that that is a real, very, good, very good question because the script that I had was, uh, you know, prior to COVID, um, it was written for live theater with uh, set and everything, and uh, but I had to scratch most of it and completely think about how I was going to put this on virtual theater without boring anyone. And what I didn't want to do is, I didn't want to, I just didn't want to look at faces in this rectangle. We already do that. We have a television. So I just wanted to do something different. And it kind of scared me. I mean, because anyone who's on this forum right now or any anyone on the chat who's in theater, we are all, all of us at one time right now are wrestling with how do you do this virtually? How do you put on a piece that will not put people to sleep? It has to be shorter. For one thing, it can't be a whole hour and a half like we do when we are performing in front of people. So those are the things that I had to think about. And with the help of my director friend, Josh Campbell, thank you very much. And I'm talking to him about it and I'm stressing about it. And he just said, why not a radio play? And I said, ah, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, so if you're on here, Josh, thank you so much. Yeah, so I had to revamp everything for the ears and not the eyes. Yeah, that it feels like it's a, it's a totally different skill. Mm -hmm. You did it so beautifully. Learning as you're going, yeah. <laughs> that actually uh, is the perfect segue into a Mr. Greg Davidson in our audience. He has a question um, that we, that we can see in the chat. Um, he asked, did you listen to recorded voices of that era in the development of your performance or just a transcript? And if you did listen, was there something you heard beneath the words that influenced your performance? Yeah, I heard, I, I listened to uh, voices from that era and uh, her speech, but mostly, well, I have family from uh, down south in specifically Georgia and Mississippi. So I had a lot of training without actually having to train for this, but it still was hard to, you know, turn on. But the, what's underneath is, a, <laughs> this in particular is, there's a, there's an, an earnesty, an underlying earnest, in that tone, in there, in 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 her voice, in that southern dialect, and uh, there there was a yeah, I st I can't put my finger on it, but it's 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 like a yeah, an earnesty. It it, it was an earnest tone that I that that I picked up underneath it. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have um, some comments, oh, not okay. so much questions, um, but compliments for you. Um, we have one recent one from a Ms. Georgina Bard. Um, Georgina. Teresa, your skill as an actor was profound and you totally <laughs> kept me engaged the entire time. I felt like I was really getting to know Fanny as a genuine person. Thank you, Georgina. That's great compliment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa, so good to see you doing Hi! <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to see what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Oh, 
I've uh, I've I've got a question, I guess, for um, for you, Teresa, and and perhaps any of your other uh, colleagues from Jowska as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I guess I'm kind of wondering, would you like, as as you're sort of kicking off our not sort of you are kicking off our festival mm -hmm. in 2020, and you're our opening night. Um, would you mind just giving us a little bit of a background? on Jowska and oh sure and what it is that that you folks are are doing and um and I'd love to hear maybe from some of the Jowska folks yes. now. Anyone else anyone else here the, yeah I think most of uh, is them is Quinn them. here Kenya those are my are they here I see a Quinn and a Kenya oh, oh. good 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 um Jowska Playworks sorry I was is... muted there he is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Jowska Playworks was, what? is a um, African-American playwriting group that I, I had, I wanted to do this for so long. And um, I, it was in my head and I got it out of my head talking to Kenya one day. We were in a coffee shop. And it was about two years ago now, right? Or three? And uh, about, about two years ago. About two years ago. And you were like, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and, you know, I knew Quinn and uh, I'm talking to Quinn about it. And Quinn is like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do it. And, you know, I think. Quinn, I had, we, in the beginning, I think I had, hadn't heard from you in about like two weeks. And then you came to me and you said, hey, you know what? First you said, don't even think about getting a building. Please don't do that. And um, you came to me and you said, you ever thought about partnering with maybe another theater company, you know, this, that and the other? I was like, no, you know, that's a great idea. And I have some people in mind. I'm just gonna ask my first person. And the first person he asked just happened to be another good friend of mine, Allison Heisman. She's the artistic director of Sympatical Theater Company. And uh, it just, I think it just snowballed from there. It was really like a freight train, a, a runaway train, the, the way things came together. And uh, we had our people mission statement and uh, here we are and all of us wear different hats we're writers and directors and actors and uh poem uh, poets and uh and we have other jobs that have nothing to do with theater and acting so uh it's a great 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 and i'm not saying this lightly mix of people we are all just badass <laughs> you out there making us proud Teresa. Yeah. <laughs> you, you forgot to add singer yeah well you know you, yeah how about you, that, you well, on that. Yeah, my, my <laughs> and if if I can just add really quickly, when um, Teresa first came, we were first talking about it. I think the thing that um, really drew me to it is that a lot of times when you're in writing groups and you're trying to develop something, it's very difficult to develop something um, in a written form if people don't understand what it is that you're writing about. So you get a lot of questions back at you like, oh, well, would this character do that? Or why are they saying this? Or why are they saying that? But when you have a group of people who can come together and you feel comfortable with and who have shared experiences, you don't, it gives you the confidence to continue writing. Because sometimes you don't have that confidence to keep, to keep going. Like we're all we're we're all trying to bring something to life here, so to be knocked down and to be told that that's not that your voice isn't that's not what they think it's supposed to be, you know. And in Jowska, there's no fear there of that. So it's a great group of people, great group of writers. 
all of whom are actively uh, group texting, even as we speak. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're all here. Okay. Oh, that's why my phone keeps beeping. All right. I'm it's not like, seeing guess, any more. Yeah, I, I was just, I was gonna just echo that, Marissa. I, I yeah. think uh, any any final thoughts, comments, questions? Uh, yeah, oh. hi, Teresa. Yes. Alex. Hi, it's Alex, how are you? Hi, Alex. I have my video on, I'm looking terrible. So uh, <laughs> I just had a question. You talked about adapting it from the stage to the radio play, but can you talk a little bit about why you adapted it as a one woman show as opposed to having multiple characters read the different voices? Well, um, I don't, I, it was just a decision that I had made and, um, I think at the time I didn't know uh, how I was going to make the sound sound like one type of sound because everybody has a different uh, computer and a different audio setup, you, you know? So um, I thought about that and then I thought about the, uh, one thing that came and went out of my mind, well, I can get them to come over here. No, you gotta stay six feet away from everybody. So uh, I, that was just the decision I made. I said, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'll just do a one woman show. Oh, it and totally that's how works. it was gonna go up as a, oh, what was that? I couldn't hear you. I was gonna say it totally works. I was just curious <laughs> why you decided. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it was just, the, the, you know what? And then the, the written, the performance, it, when it was, was going to get performed in the theater, it was gonna be a one woman show, but like not. And so I just, you know, I just said, well, I'll just do all the voices. It was just a decision and I'm glad I made that decision. All right, cool. Well, well done. And your voice is beautiful, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. No, I saw we had. Sorry, <laughs> don't mean to monopolize the conversation, but I have so many questions. Um, the sort of jumping off of of uh, Alex's question there, um, when as the one woman play, I thought it was so smart, and I and I and I was wondering during it, like who, who when you're writing this, who do you imagine that she's speaking to? Uh, or, or did that factor in? I imagine she was speaking to a room full of young people who had registered to vote. I imagine if she was living now that she was, she probably would be speaking to still a room full of young people who were registering to vote, especially now. So um, that's who I had in mind when I was writing it, like a room full of people and she was telling her story. And this is why not, I'm, you know, don't register to vote because you need to register to vote, although you do need to register to vote, but this is exactly why you need to register to vote. We have a couple questions. Um, one from my lovely mama, is she still? Here she is. Her camera is off. Wendy Klein. <laughs> I think she went away for a minute. So we will come back to her. Um, our lovely Christine had a question. Christine, feel free to pop. Hi, Teresa. Um, hi. Hi. Thank you so much. This was just an incredible experience. And um, I really enjoyed the I really enjoyed the the radio play piece of it too because it just gave me a chance to kind of sit back and and envision and listen which can be a really beautiful experience and um it also on zoom made it so that there were never any audio issues because it was yeah it was beautifully <laughs> beautiful to hear at all times but i i put in the comments that the music really sticks out to me and um, I, I recall from the podcast that you report that you recorded earlier this week that 
you know, the, the title is based on the song. I woke up this morning with my mind and yeah. I, I've never heard the song before. Yeah. And so yeah. I wondered if you might um, share anything about the history of that song or what it meant to your character. Uh, actually, Fannie Lou Hamer's favorite song was the first one. Um, this is a little light of mine. She always sang it. And uh, I woke up this morning with my mind is a is a song that a lot of African-American protesters would sing when they would march. And I woke up with love on my mind I, and, the, and the verses would change all the time. So, I mean, you can basically put anything in there to represent what you're doing, but it's actually, it's from a gospel song that was turned into a protest song. And she sang that when she would be out protesting, Martin Luther King sang it, uh, Medgar Evers, yeah. Thank you. That's You're welcome. Um, so my mother has actually posed a question in the chat. Um, she says she's embarrassed to admit that she never heard of Fannie Lou before tonight. Something tells her that there are like, likely additional stories of others who moved the needle. History books have surely left out these important voices. It's very true. That's true. Are there particular resources you would recommend to learn more? Can can you recommend any? Uh, let's see. She has an autobiography. Uh, I think it's called the Fanny Lou Hamer story. Uh, and there's also there's also a, doc, a PBS documentary on her. It's not very long, but there's a PBS documentary on her. And then there's other resources. If you go on like Wikipedia and you scroll all the way down to the references and resources, there's uh, a bunch of, uh, it'll, the links will take you to a lot of the PBS specials. It'll take you to uh, a lot of the marches that she, participated in with Martin Luther King and Medgar Evers. So, uh, and then you can kind of sort of piece together your, you know, your, your research like that. Um, our friend, uh, we have a couple friends uh, who posed in the chat. Um, there's a PBS link um, about Fannie Lou Hamer's stand-up, as well as um, the oh, and Kristen has uh, said that the podcast that Christine was referring to, where Teresa was interviewed this week, is in the chat. Um, so, if you are interested in checking that out, there it is. Um, did we have any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for asking your questions and being here tonight. Um, Marissa, my, I'll take I'll take the baton yeah. for you to kind of close That's out right. the night. Yeah. Um, my name is Emily Cross. I am the tech director for this year's festival. So I've been sweating it out on Zoom this whole time. <laughs> Glad that everything worked out and everything went well. It so did. I'm running any kind of Zoom theater. We're all in this kind of new horizon together. Um, so I would just want to thank everyone for being here tonight with us virtually. Well, we're all in our own homes, but we are able to be together in some way. Um, so I just want to express that sentiment. Um, and being in the presence of beautiful, beautiful work by Teresa. So once again, thank you, Teresa, for your work. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Um, this is only the first of um, many events in our PWTF Festival of 2020. Our next event is this Sunday at 3 p.m. It is a reading of Eight Year History by Rachel Atkins. Um, more information is available on our website and our Facebook page um, for links and tickets and all that kind of stuff. So we would love if you could join us for the second performance of our opening weekend. 
And then after that, um, we've got a performance on August 20th. So keep an eye out for some more information about that. Um, thank you again for being here. This was a wonderful experience and a great way to kick off our festival. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And with that, I'm everybody going to have a good night. You have too. Good night. good night. Thank you. I'm going to end the Zoom and we will see you hopefully on Sunday. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.